Hello everyone. I am Dr. Prashant and in this presentation we will talk about meningitis and encephalitis. In a patient with fever, headache and neck rigidity, if there is no altered mental status, then we must immediately proceed to blood culture and a lumbar puncture. However, if there is fever and headache along with altered mental status, in that case the patient is now classified as encephalitis and we must consider meningoencephalitis, acute disseminated encephalomyelitis or ADEM, encephalopathy or a mass lesion in the brain. And in this case, we must do a blood culture and start empirical antimicrobial therapy and then proceed to a head CT or MRI instead of a lumbar puncture at first. If the head CT or MRI shows a mass lesion, then this can be managed with medical or surgical interventions. If there is no mass lesion, however, in that case, we must look for focal or generalized gray matter abnormalities or the MRI may be normal, in which case it becomes encephalitis or the MRI may show white matter abnormalities, in which case it becomes acute disseminated encephalomyelitis. In both of these conditions, we must now proceed with the blood culture and the lumbar puncture. And if the CSF shows pleocytosis with PMNs and elevated protein, decreased glucose and gram stain positivity, we will think of an acute bacterial process. Or if it shows pleocytosis with MNCs, normal protein, normal or decreased glucose, or gram stain negativity, we may think of a viral process. We will discuss CSF analysis in detail. The diagnostic modalities for diagnosis of meningitis and encephalitis include CSF examination, CSF polymerase chain reaction or CSF-PCR, CSF culture, serologic studies and antigen detection, MRI, CT and electro encephalography or EEG and finally brain biopsy. Let us now discuss the cerebrospinal fluid examination. This slide shows the normal values for osmolarity, glucose, pH, total protein, CSF pressure and leukocytes in the cerebrospinal fluid. We will discuss CSF under the following heads, the pressure, the cell count, glucose and protein in various pathological conditions. In acute bacterial meningitis, the pressure is more than 180 millimeters of water in 90% of the cases and the cell count is high polymorphonuclear cells more than 100 in 90% of the cases. The glucose is low, presumably because the bacteria consume the glucose and it is less than 40 milligrams per deciliter and the protein is raised at 45 milligrams per deciliter in more than 90 percent of the cases. In viral meningitis, the pressure is normal or mildly raised. The cell count is predominantly mononuclear or lymphocytic with a count ranging between 25 to 500. The glucose is normal and the protein may be high between 20 to 80 milligrams per deciliter. In fungal meningitis, the pressure may be normal or mildly raised. There is lymphocytic mononuclear pleocytosis, the glucose is low and the protein is again high. In tubercular meningitis, the pressure is increased, the cell count is predominantly lymphocytic, the glucose is again low and the protein is often very high, high enough to form a coagulum, also known as the cobweb appearance. In autoimmune encephalitis, the pressure is normal, the cell count is predominantly lymphocytic, the glucose is normal and the protein is also normal. During the cerebrospinal fluid examination, 20 ml should be collected and 10 ml should be stored for later studies. We have already discussed the findings in various conditions. However, immunosuppressed patients may fail to mount a CSF inflammatory response. What this means is patients with immunodeficiency virus, or patients having received a bone marrow transplant may not show a neutrophilic or lymphocytic response in response to a bacterial or viral infection respectively. Atypical lymphocytes in CSF may be due to the Epstein-Barr virus, the cytomegalovirus and the enterovirus and if there is persistent CSF neutrophilia then we must consider an alternative diagnosis. 
significant red blood cells of more than 500 per cubic millimeter after a traumatic tap has been ruled out generally indicates hemorrhagic encephalitis and decreased CSF glucose is also possible in certain viral conditions like mumps, cytomegalovirus, advanced herpes simplex virus and in general autoimmune encephalitis will require antibody assays. The cerebrospinal fluid PCR is the primary diagnostic modality for herpes simplex virus, cytomegalovirus, Epstein-Barr virus, the human herpes virus and the enterovirus. The sensitivity seen is 96% with a specificity of 99% and this exceeds brain biopsy in the case of the herpes simplex virus. HSV PCR may be negative within the first 72 hours and may require repeat at the end of 7 days. 98% PCRs will remain positive within the first week and this will reduce to about 1 in 5 after 15 days. The sensitivity for enterovirus PCR is more than 95% but for Epstein-Barr virus the sensitivity for the polymerase chain reaction is not known. Varicella zoster virus will require IgM assays for intrathecal synthesis and increased serum to HSV antibody ratio for the herpes simplex virus may be useful. In autoimmune encephalitis, CSF culture is of limited value in diagnosis. In autoimmune encephalitis, the antibodies may be anti-NMDAR, anti-GABA, anti-AMPA, anti-CASPER2, anti-DPPX, antibodies to IgLON5, stiff person spectrum disorder and MGULR spectrum disorder antibodies may also be present. In amoebic meningoencephalitis, the CSF picture resembles bacterial meningitis in that there is neutrophilic predominance, the cell count may be more than 1000, the glucose is low and the protein is high, the pressure is also high. However, in amoebic meningoencephalitis, mobile trophozoites are seen in warm, fresh CSF and there may be history of children swimming in ponds and lakes. Mortality in amoebic meningoencephalitis approaches nearly 100% and there is unfortunately no effective treatment for this condition. These are some of the magnetic resonance images in encephalitis. In herpes simplex encephalitis, the temporal lobe is predominantly involved as seen here. In Japanese encephalitis, the thalamus is involved and this is the MRI picture of autoimmune encephalitis. Let us begin with a brief discussion of the general principles of management for meningitis and encephalitis. In general, the patient must be admitted to an intensive care with intracranial pressure monitoring being done. Fluid restriction and seizure control is required. We must observe the patient for aspiration pneumonia, stasis ulcers, contractures, deep vein thrombosis and infections of indwelling lines and catheters. We will now move on to the management of specific encephalitic syndromes. Acyclovir may be empirically started when reports are awaited and may be stopped if the reports are not suggestive of a viral meningitis. The adult dose is 10 mg per kg intravenous every 8 hours for 14 to 21 days and the dilution of acyclovir must be made to less than 7 mg per milliliter. Elevations in urea and creatinine along with thrombocytopenia and GI distress is common and acyclovir resistant isolates are not clinically significant as of now. The mechanism of action of acyclovir is as follows. This is a virus along with the thymidine kinase. Acyclovir converts to acyclovir monophosphate and then inside the host cell it converts into acyclovir triphosphate. This is a schematic diagram of the GNA chain elongation. Acyclovir triphosphate terminates elongation of this chain which results in impaired viral replication and death. The oral alternatives for acyclovir include famcyclovir and valacyclovir which is given at a dose of 2 grams 3 times a day for 3 months and is generally used after parenteral acyclovir. 
However, a study based on dementia rating scale, mini mental scale and the Glasgow coma scale, there was no difference at 12 months when compared to placebo. We'll now move on to CMV related CNS infections and the treatment of choice here is ganthetic nucleoside analog of 2 deoxyguanosine and is active against the cytomegalovirus. It is given at a dose of 5 mg per kg every 12 hours and granulocytopenia and thrombocytopenia may be dose limiting. Oral prodrug valgancyclovir is of limited efficacy in central nervous system infections. The next drug is Foscarnet, which is a pyrophosphate analog that inhibits viral DNA polymerase at a dose of 60 mg per kg 3 times a day for 14 to 21 days and up to one third of patients will develop renal impairment and reduction in calcium and magnesium and potassium may cause tetany and arrhythmia. The third option for cytomegalovirus treatment is cytophobia, which is a nucleotide analog used to treat CMV retinitis. However, the data is limited for CNS infections and is given at a dose of 5 mg per kg for two weeks. And pre-medication with IV fluids and probe benicid is required because of hyperuricemia. And nephrotoxicity with cytophobia may warrant dose reduction. We will now move on to the management of encephalitis based on the clinical practice guidelines by the Infectious Diseases Society of North America. For herpes simplex virus, we can use acyclovir. For varicella zoster, we can again use acyclovir. For CMV, as already discussed, we can use gancyclovir and foscarnet. For Epstein-Barr virus, steroids may be beneficial, although this is only class 3 evidence. For human herpes 6, Gancyclovir and Foscarnet may be used as for CMV. For influenza, Oseltamivir is the drug of choice. For measles, we can use Ribavirin. For Nipah virus, Ribavirin again. For human immunodeficiency virus, we must use the highly active antiretroviral therapy. For the JC or John Cunningham virus, we must plan reversal of immunosuppression. For Bartonella, ciprofloxacin, doxycycline and septran may be used. Listeria can be treated with ampicillin and gentamicin. Mycoplasma can be treated with azithromycin, doxycycline and fluoroquinolones. Whipple's disease can be treated with ceftriaxone, septran and cefixim. Mycobacterium tuberculosis is treated with anti-tubercular therapy. Rickettsia can be treated with doxycycline. Coxiella burnetti will require treatment with doxycycline, afloroquinolone, and rifampicin. Borrelia bugdorferi can be treated with ceftriaxone. Treponema pallidium is treated with penicillin G. And cryptococcus with amphotericin B and flucytosin. Histoplasma with amphotericin B and itroconazole. Coccidioides with fluconazole. Acanthamoeba with septran and rifampicin along with ketoconazole. Nagleria with amphotericin B and rifampicin, Plasmodium falciparum with quinine or artisanate, Toxoplasma with pyrimethamine, sulfadiazine or clindamycin, Trypanosoma with eflornithine or melarsoprol, Teniasolium with albendazole and corticosteroids, and acute disseminated encephalomyelitis is treated with high dose corticosteroids. Autoimmune encephalitis, the treatment options are glucocorticoids, rituximab, mycophenolate, cyclosporin, intravenous immunoglobulin, and plasma exchange. In a patient with unilateral or bilateral mesial temporal hyperintensities or subcortical hyperintensity with or without enhancement on MRI brain, along with a generalized or focal slowing of epileptiform discharges, and an elevated protein, pleocytosis, and abnormal oligoclonal bands, along with antibody testing, we can consider autoimmune encephalitis. Now, we must start this patient on IV methylprednisolone 1 gram per day for 5 days, or we can also give the patient intravenous immun immunoglobulin at 0.4 milligrams per kg daily for 5 days, and plasma exchange may be considered in patients who have had a severe attack or an incomplete response to steroids.
If there is no improvement after IV methylprednisolone, intravenous immunoglobulin and plasma exchange, we can consider IV rituximab 375 mg per meter square per week for 4 weeks or IV cyclophosphamide 1 gram IV every month for 6 months and if there is improvement we can give the patient oral prednisolone with a taper for 4 to 6 weeks or oral as a thioprin or oral mycophenolate mofetil. That's it for our video on meningitis and encephalitis. We will see you in the next video.